The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers or Rogers TV. Welcome to Politically Speaking here on Rogers TV. I'm your host, Paul Nicholson. We're on the road. We're actually doing a road trip. We're uh, celebrating the grand opening of the Link here in Sutton tonight, and my first guest on the show is Mayor Margaret Clark. Welcome, Margaret. Good to see you again. Glad to see you're on the road, Paul. I'm on the road. On the road. This is like grand tour. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and if you listen in the background, it's my band. No, <laughs> we're hearing Buffalo Springfield. <laughs> anyway, so congratulations. Thank it's you. Not done. No, it's not done. It's the it's, initial tranche. It's, it's, it's like the start of, of the, the beginning of many many openings. Exactly. So how did you? Uh, uh, you've had the tour, obviously. You know what's going on. But pretend like you're pretend new. Pretend like you're new. <laughs> well, when you come in, there's a beautiful entrance away. You come straight to the back, and you turn to your left. You go down to the uh, food pantry. Beautiful window space open they're going to do their fit up in there and actually we might have a corporate sponsor for some of the fit up i don't want to jinx it by saying who but there could be yes there could be some uh, some corporate dollars coming for that we've got hospice georgina coming into another space we have uh, roots georgina that's hopefully coming in we've got the gtti and the fabulous kitchen we've got a number of groups that have put expressions of interest in for the space that's ready to be fitted up because what we've done with the the link is prepare the space for those groups to come in. We've done the, the major things, like the not so sexy stuff, the, the roof, the, the plumbing, the wiring, you know, the, the HVAC, the boilers. The individual space, they'll have to fit up to their own individual needs. Right. So you talked about the kitchen. Corey Dorn, I know you're married and I'm married, but would you marry me? <laughs> Do you realize how big I would be if I was married to Corey Dorn? I'd be the size of a house. It's great food. The kitchen is fabulous. Is fabulous. I had the opportunity, to, we had an open house for staff a couple weeks ago, and I had the opportunity to, to cook in that kitchen and to make some biscuits in the turbo convection oven that they cooked to a golden brown in like seven minutes. It was amazing. There's a big tilting skillet in there. It's like the biggest frying pan that you've ever seen. That you can cook, you can grill up things, you can make soup, chili, and then it tilts to pour it out. It's awesome. That's perfect. Yeah, I was, I was, we were talking before we went on the air here. I want that at home. Oh, and, I know. And so, you know I wore a coat. Do you yeah. think I could fit it in? I don't know if you could fit it I think you have to fight Corey for it. Corey's in love with it. For so sure. For it's sure. a fabulous kitchen. As I said in the video and, and in the, uh, the opening, it's the heart and soul of, of the link. Very much so, very much so. I have seen other uh, hub uh, projects throughout Ontario. They're not everywhere by any means. John D. Faberi did talk about uh, uh, the wisdom and the vision of council in seeing this not as an eyesore or a blight or something that could be bulldozed and redeveloped, but having the vision to retask this structure to new means and it's okay it's not uh there's some some effort and some it's like an onion you, you, you feel, feel it like, oh. yeah. as i said when you do any sort of renovation of an old structure you're going to find like the oh my gods in there but i just want to mention and give credit to previous council yeah. previous mayor rob brossi the members of council took that big step to, to start this project and certainly they they deserve the, the credit for seeing the vision of what this could become and i'm glad that our council has taken on that that vision to continue on with phase one and the phase two well the other thing is when you look at sutton look at what we've done with old infrastructure and new infrastructure you know uh we've got the uh, the black river saint bernadette's pool library daycare center we did that oh, 20 years, years ago. ago. And that was one of the first public-private you know, partnerships, two school boards, a municipal level of government, and a private daycare. I don't think there, there wasn't any other, and I don't know if there has been since, where the two school boards and a municipal government, it's almost unheard. Yeah, to try to, to get that connection. So we've sort of blazed the trail on this side of the, of the road now and said, let's do something that uh, is creative, that's innovative. Let's take a, a school and instead of, as John said, just 
tearing it down and, and starting over on something that may or may not ever happen. Because once you tear something down, you, you can't get, you can't put it look, back. Yeah, and look at the bill. So yeah. you know, look look at uh, some of the projects around that that uh, you think they're going to go and they never do, and that vacant land sits there vacant. So I'm glad that that we've continued on with, with the project. Phase two is, is there. We're, we're working on the accessibility ramp that's being constructed right, right now. Right. Um, phase one, it won't be long before it's full because we've got a list of, of community groups that want to come in, like Jericho, um, Roots Church, you know, Legal Aid Clinic, uh, a, a number of, of uh, regional uh, government groups as well, agencies that want to come in and provide those services. And as I said, it's linking not just social, but economic, entrepreneurs. If you've got a, a small business that you need to have a commercial kitchen that's public health inspected because you want to start butter tart business or homemade jams or you do a lot of cooking. I do. Yeah. If you want to start that kind of business, here's your commercial kitchen. And if we can get, uh, you know, York Works involved in here, Job Skills involved in here, the Learning Center, GTTI with their courses, the possibilities, it's simply, it's, it's a cliche to say it, but it's true. The possibilities are endless. And, and what I think people might not necessarily understand is that this represents a net savings to these organizations rather than having them scattered uh, among the community. Yeah, the collaborations, the synergies, the fact that they can be coexist in the same building and not have to have their own washroom, their own boardroom, their own common space. They can have, they can still pay rent because a number of these agencies do pay rent in other places. And sometimes they're paying on a on a main street a retail space that maybe the retail side of things would prefer to have that space used in other ways and not have that social agency there. So bring them into a, a central hub, the link, and let the partners work together and develop programming, develop linkages, and develop those programs that everybody can benefit from. So phase two, what does that look like and, and when does that maybe happen? Well, we start our budget deliberations soon, so yeah, I'm I sure... Know. I was there last yeah, night. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. I'm sure there is a section in the budget that, that talks about uh, the, the phasing in of that project. Uh, we have roof repairs to do there. Uh, we'd like to get the programming room that's sort of behind us here yeah. done. Um, but that whole section, we need to um, do the, the, as I say, the, the not so fun looking um, yeah, fit up. So not the glamorous. Not the glamorous. Stuff, yeah. But I think if we're trying to, once we get this rented, we'll be starting to, to work in there and add the tenants. And as the tenants come on board, and I think once they see what we have here, as, as John said in his speech, the roof is going to explode with, with the potential, the opportunities, and the interest in that in that second phase. It's, it's for me. It's it's just a, a a logical outgrowth of how Georgina feels about itself, and, and we've always tried to run a frugal organization. And, a, and a, I don't want to say frugal; I think that sound bad, but an efficient organizing organization. And you know, this just I think reinforces that underlying uh, sensibility that Georgina's have. Yeah. So instead of having, as I said two boardrooms, three boardrooms with three or four groups, you've got one, and it's working together, and it's that connection of, geez, you're doing this event, we're doing this event, why don't we do something together get more bang and get more and more bang for the buck? You've got the facility with the, the commercial kitchen, the facility for the, the gym to have fundraising events. We talked about the indoor space, but we've got all that outdoor space too. So the rewilding that's going to happen there in terms of common spaces, community gardens, the learning that people can, can go from the food pantry to the community gardens to the community kitchen. The, the um, hospice is hoping to build a gazebo for meditation and, and uh, just getting connected to the environment and having those common areas outside that we all enjoy. So maybe I, I, our, our viewers might not know what rewilding means. What does that mean? It's a fancy word for um, landscaping. Maybe that's a little too simplified. I'm sure the rewilding it, committee would. It's going, oh my gosh, you said landscaping. It's finding out what people want to see in an outdoor space and building that space that accommodates that. So if we want an outdoor space that has a farmer's market or common areas for, for sitting or walking paths or being able to get close to the, the river, because we do back onto the river here. Um, just 
setting up berms to try to get the flow of people going through, getting a linkage over to high street, having those areas that people can enjoy. It's a nice link between high street and Dalton Road. Isn't that a good name, the link? Yeah. It's a nice link to high street. Yeah. Perfect link. Perfect link. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So you do, uh, just as a matter of curiosity, uh, do you see uh, this being more for community groups or what about uh, a possibility for an incubator? Remember we used to have... We used, yeah, yeah, certainly the, um, the economic side of things. If you're wanting to start up a business, you know, you need uh, an office space, you need a professional looking meeting room, you need to have a, a, a mailbox address that sounds better than, than you know, PO box, whatever. So it's a way to help those those small companies start up, and it could be a multimedia company that's starting up, uh, you know, photography. It could be, as I said before, in the kitchen, people doing uh, home uh, homemade jams. So having and then having the programming to help them get GTTI in there, give you the skills, get job skills, or the learning center in here to give you those skills, and then having the synergies of having the different groups here that provide the other network opportunities. Right. So if you were to look back on this next year, the year after, how would you deem this to be a success? What do you what would you define as a success? For this to be fully rented and phase two to be in a in a year, if we have phase two done and rented by the end of 2016, 2017, I'd be thrilled. Uh, we, we can hope. We, we can, can hope. hope. However, what's the Dalton Road reconstruction going on? Uh, yeah, you saw that on council. Yeah, yeah. That will certainly have an impact, but I think it won't stop us happening here. The other thing I'd love to see here is, as I alluded to in the speech, is we're keeping our options open for the north area. If we could get some kind of seniors housing in here as well, connected through. What a great way to, to involve the seniors yeah. and, and, you know, the, the community kitchen, the, the projects that would be involved, connecting youth and seniors. Again, the possibilities, it's endless. I'd be looking for opportunities to buy other land, too. I mean, you know, where are you? Mm -hmm. uh, then I could say, you know, uh, yeah, I could see we could really build this up to be something, something else. else. I mean, there's the other side of the street, too, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just one side of the street, there's yeah, two exactly. sides. Um, well, the municipality took over St. Bernadette's, the old St. Bernadette School, and we did something with that as well. Right. Right? So it's all been turned into something value of value to our community. Exactly. And that's what's nice to see. You know, it's just... I can't say enough. Now, we talked about uh, a, uh, a uh, marketplace. And, and do you think that we could actually move the farmer's market? It's a potential farm? site. It's one of the sites that's being looked at. Uh, we did have an application with the Canada 150 grants to, to do it here. Um, there's no decision been made on the farmer's market. But we are. it's one of the, the possible sites. And if we can get some grant money from another association, another group, we can probably uh, try to move forward with that. But even without it being... Done to the rewilding may be able to help us to to start something here with, with the uh, farmers market. So you uh, you have shovel ready programs in case there is a like Trudeau has talked about more infrastructure. This is shovel ready. That that back wing, it's it's shovel ready. It's if we had if an infrastructure project was announced tomorrow, I think you'd see our application going right in pretty quick because uh, certainly it's it's there it's ready and that's the whole idea we're we've got plans we've got you know the the ideas right there to, to go and that's what they'll be looking for well exactly that's and that's a way to finish this off and and, and kick start the the, uh, the long-term plan i think it'd be fantastic especially if there's money for seniors housing because finally a government is talking about actually investing in uh, affordable housing so no, why not? And with that, you, you need a partnership between, you know, different levels of government and the, the private sector. You need the development community to realize that they can't just be putting up single-family houses or, or townhouses. They need to focus in. We're all an aging population, so the senior housing is key. I am an aging population. Are you older than me or younger than me? I can't remember. I probably am. I think so. I think we're about the same age. Oh, well, maybe, yeah. Maybe. we got more gray hair, but then, you know. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
So this is a, this is going to be a crowning achievement for you. I got to well, believe you're very proud. I certainly wanted to acknowledge the previous council and Mayor Grassi with his foresight and vision. I don't want to take credit where, where you know this council. It was a joint venture. It was a joint venture, and I think this new council did embrace the idea. And as John said, we could have said, hey, you know what? Put the brakes on. We're not interested. But we embraced the idea as well and carried forward on it. Great. Thank you very much, Margaret. Thanks, Paul. Take My care. My guest is Mayor Margaret Quirk. This is Politically Speaking. I'm Paul Nichols. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Welcome back to Politically Speaking here on Rogers TV. I'm your host, Paul Nichols. And to the sounds of CCR and uh, Susie Q, I'd like to welcome <laughs> Phil Rose Donahoe. And you're the manager of cultural services. Service. Culture, Down culture, in Georgia. That's right. Welcome. You haven't been on our show before. I've never so. been on. I've been on other Rogers shows, but never yours. So it's a well, pleasure to be here. Oh, there you go. You're getting to, you're, this is where we. Does he carry an hour? Does he not carry an hour? I'll try. Sorry. My goal is in a couple of years to have my own show. I'm oh. just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> well, this one? <laughs> yeah, maybe. The pay is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. <laughs> so tell us all about the, the link and what you found. Like You talked about it in your uh, speech tonight. Sure. That you were, shall we, trial by ordeal. Right. How else do you put it? Right. Uh, you hadn't really done a major construction project before, so tell us a little bit about that background, what that, maybe sure. some of the things you said. Sure, yeah, well, so uh, I'm, as a manager of cultural services, somebody who is uh, familiar with uh, arts programming, cultural mapping, cultural planning, cultural policy, those types of things, uh, getting involved in this project. So I got involved in this project in about 2012. Uh, or 13. I've been working on it consistently since then. And as I said, you know, the, the project appealed to me because it was about uh, it was about culture. The art gallery was uh, associated uh, with the project at that, at that point. Uh, there was a cultural component to it. But when we got into the construction phase, that's where I felt, wow, I don't know if I'm ready, if I'm suited for this job. Because we were talking about uh, engineering and structural engineering stuff and construction stuff that I just didn't feel like I was uh, ready for. But, uh, you know, we had, a, we had a great architect, a great uh, contractor, uh, really patient with us. And uh, it, was a, it was an amazing uh, education for me, amazing learning experience. And I really became a bit more aware about uh, the importance of space to culture in terms of how people use space, in terms of the types of programs that happen in space, uh, the types of ways that you can empower people to use the space through architecture. So I, uh, I got a bit familiar with terms and, uh, and things that along the way that I never thought I would, but it turned out really well. Yeah. You were talking about all these acronyms. Acronyms, uh, yeah, open web steel joists and VAV, variable air volume or whatever it was. Things, again, that I never thought as a manager of cultural services I'd ever get into, but uh, I loved it. I loved every second of it. I loved uh, working with the architect and the contractor. Did it bring a new dimension to your understanding of your your career and what, you know, like how people interact with physical structures? It did. It, it, it made me aware of a couple of things. One, culture is not just about museums and it's not just about theaters. It's about community services as much as it is about cultural services. So oftentimes, I, you know, I think uh, myself as more of a manager of community services. I have the good fortune of, of, of not necessarily being behind my desk from 9, you know, 8.30 in the morning to 4.30. I have this great opportunity to meet you know, all the people that are here tonight on a regular basis to make friends, to make connections. And so I began to realize that it, you know, it's not always about going to the theater and watching a show. It's about connecting people. It's about trying to find ways that people can work together. Uh, yeah, there's a cultural component to it in some ways. But I always think of this metaphor of you know, culture as this iceberg. So you know, the things that are above the water are the things like theater and music and fine arts. And when you get down below the surface, you realize that it's about values, it's about traditions. It's much more all-encompassing, and it's the part you don't really you know, pay attention to all the time, and you don't recognize. So, uh, yeah, through working, uh, you know, designing and, and changing a physical space, it made me a lot more aware of, of culture as a community venture, as a community initiative. Community adventure. Adventure, um, or a misadventure. I mean, that's the, the nice thing about this project, in a way, is that it was kind of 
uh, a messy project. And I mean messy in the sense that it wasn't a linear, you know, we're going to do a feasibility study, then we're going to go find a piece of property, then we're going to raise funds, and then we're going to build. It was kind of everything happened, you know, all over the place. Yeah, we had the building, we had the property before we knew what we were going to do with it, before we had any funding to do anything with it. So it was something organic about it, and in a way it allowed us to rely a lot more on our community partners to really come along and so it seemed like it was less of a top-down approach to community planning rather than a really kind of collaborative approach. And I, that's kind of what we're hoping will continue now, now that we're in the building. I think you just mentioned the, the key word, and that was in the presentation uh, uh, that I saw with you know, this little movie that uh, uh, Michelle's husband, Michelle Vendetta, Vendetta, Your brother, her brother. Your bro oh, brother, brother, okay, yeah, anyway, brother. who made a, a movie, and, and it just, it talked about collaboration, and, and that's such a key element in this particular project, more than any other. Um, how did you manage to get that interest, or was it always there? I think it was always there. Uh, the, the history of the project was that we bought the property in July of 2011. Uh, the former mayor, Rob Grassi, uh, was uh, very quickly went out to the community and did a public consultation. And very quickly we knew that there was a demand for space among nonprofit organizations. Now at that time there wasn't quite the understanding of what the cost of, of converting the space was or how much it would cost actually for those tenants to come in. Um, but we had a lot, it was like a you know, moth to a flame. As soon as this building was purchased by the town, as soon as we went out and tested the waters and said, hey, we got a space, what do we want to do with it? We had nonprofit organizations, we had, we had young people who wanted a skateboard park come forward and ha have a petition. It was really kind of this uh, instantaneous kind of collaborative thing that happened where the community just said, we need space, we want space, we're willing to work together, we're willing to share the space. So everything kind of was you know, set off from, from that purchasing the property. And then it was just a matter of trying to manage expectations to make sure that we weren't promising too much, that we weren't saying, you know, the space was going to be free necessarily. Yes, we can find efficiencies by having, you know, things like uh, contracted services shared amongst five or six tenants. So it was, it was, yeah, you know, the community was primed for working together and finding solutions together right from the very beginning. And it's only going to grow uh, at the end of the day, more tenants. How many tenants do you think will actually be able to fit in here? Oh, that's a, that's a, it really depends on their square footage. But, you know, the average what we're seeing is somewhere around eight to 1,200 square feet that these organizations want. They don't need a lot because they're not large organizations. They usually have two or three staff, so they don't need big space. I think we're probably going to max out around 15 to 20, 22 organizations. But again, it depends. We might have one organization that comes in with the ability to fix up a space, with sustainable funding, and they may say, I want 8,000 square feet. And if, and if they fit the criteria, uh, and we have council approval, then we could give them 8,000 square feet. So, but I would say, I mean, probably by the end of 2016, we'll see anywhere from six to eight organizations actively in this, in this space as permanent uh, tenants. And then say by 2020, I would say, and the goal is anyways to have it completely occupied with maybe 15 to 20 organizations in here. There are other organizations that are still freestanding. Uh, have you made open approaches to them to try and convince them to participate in this venture? We're trying not to, we're trying not to convince organizations to come in. We're trying to do as much outreach as possible. When we wrote the business plan for um, this, this building, we consulted with almost 40 organizations across the GTA. Toronto, Barrie, Aurelia, all across York Region. And we basically said, uh, if you had a space like this in Georgina, would you provide more services for your clients? And a lot of them said yes. And a lot of those people we consulted uh, uh, ran a, a hub type of project. So we also learned from them. So um, I'm trying to remember what the, sorry, I forgot what the, what the question was. Go ahead, community outreach. Yeah, so I think, you know, we, we have, uh, rather than, so what we've done now is we have an expressions of interest process that we've set up. So on a, you know, probably two or three times a year, we're going to uh, put this expression of interest document out. Organizations will have the ability to uh, fill the document out. Uh, we'll ask certain things about organizational readiness, about are you, you know, do you think the fit with the mission is there? Are you financially sustainable as far as being able to pay the, you know, the license agreement cost? 
Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll probably circulate that through our networks with uh, United Way York Region Toronto, um, through Linking Georgina here locally, and we'll just use our network to be able to say, hey, you know, we're accepting more applications and more tenants, and we're hope that that will, that will work. We just finished our last expression of interest process. Actually, we're in the process of determining uh, who else is going to be in here, and we had a really good response. We've got about five more organizations that want to come into this space. Um, so we think every time we put it out, if we get five or six, uh, if we get five or six uh, um, people or organizations that want to come in, we think by 2020 we'll have the place built. That's great. Well, it's, when you, is it going to make money or is it going to break even? Like, what's the goal? The goal is actually for it to, uh, to either break even, which is really the minimal goal. But we actually see this um, pretty much uh, being either a cost-neutral affair for taxpayers or making a little bit of money. Uh, we haven't quite understood in terms of how that, um, well, I shouldn't say that. What, what would happen is the more organizations that come in here, the shared cost for things like uh, the common spaces we see behind us, the more organizations sharing that cost, the, the lower it goes. So the, the, the per square footage cost that we're proposing for 2016, the council's approved, is in line with commercial space here in Sutton right now. Because we know that supply is high, demand is low, so it's about 12 to 12.50 uh, per square foot. What happens is between uh, 2016 and 2020, that comes down to roughly nine dollars per square foot, which is below market value. But the more organizations that are paying that per square footage, it means the level of subsidization from the town gets reduced. So we think that there's a multiplier effect that happens when organizations share space. Oh, no question. I mean, I was talking to Mayor Margaret about it, and, and uh, we're, if you think about it, all these organizations are paying for bathrooms and taxes and da 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 da, da. And, and here, you share those costs, Absolutely. and so your overall costs go down for everybody, which means that there's more money for program. More money for programs, yeah, they share cleaning services, photocopier license or lease. Uh, you know, toilet paper, for goodness sakes. I mean, everything right down to toilet paper. If you share it and you're, and you're splitting those costs, it's the ability to use your collective buying power to find, some, to find some efficiencies. So we think that we can actually provide a space that is amazing. It's beautiful. It, is beautiful. Uh, it speaks to the needs of the, of the community organizations, but it actually means that they can find efficiencies and hopefully, as you say, you know, find some savings on their bottom lines which allows them to increase their services and programs back to the community. And that's that's what, at the end of the day, that's the benefit to the community, right? And we see a lot of, uh, there, there's, organi the community hubs are becoming very popular, not just in Ontario. In Ontario in particular, um, the province, the provincial government said, we have a lot of decommissioned public schools, we have a lot of public spaces that are underutilized, and so they started a special advisory committee that I sit on for community hubs. And it's a consultation group to say, how do we learn from each other and what kind of models can we bring to bear to, to make better use of our public spaces? But Cubs have been around for a long, long time across North America and they are successful and they've proven to be successful. And a lot of them find upwards of five to seven percent of uh, efficiencies and reductions in the bottom line for the organizations that use the space be just because of the nature of that business model that's set up in these kinds of spaces. Exactly. Now, is the building been engineered in such a way that you can go up? That's an interesting question. I, I'm not knowing. Uh, I, that's a good question. I think you know everything. Uh, um, is, you know, in a way, it's just about money. Oh, yeah. Right? So I think if you really wanted to do it, you could probably throw a whole lack of money. But I don't know how much, uh, how much it would cost, to be honest with you. We do have a lot of, we do have a lot, we have six and a half acres, so we, we have a lot more space. The one thing that we've talked about, and we, we've had some initial conversations with York Region, um, the housing uh, staff there, is uh, on the north wing of the property, which is just down this way, we've demolished about 8,000 square feet of the building. Yeah. And uh, we've had some initial conversations about how can we address affordable housing. Uh, especially for seniors. So we're in the process of trying to think about what kind of uh, density we can have there, what kind of height. And so for Sutton, we may have, you know, possibly a building, I mean, this is hypothetical and this is somewhere down the road, of, you know, five stories high, maybe, you know, somewhere one or two hundred units, small units, but they'd be geared to income. Um, so there's certainly room to grow up that way. As far as this space, I'm not too sure. A lot of organizations, not a lot of organizations, some people have said that it's rare to have a flat roof. Yeah. 
So if you, pe people from the city love the fact that you could do actually gardening or some sort of green roof on, on the flat roof. And we've had so a lot of more solar uh, energy companies that have come to the town. And any of them that come and have done pitches to mayor and council, uh, if they know about this building, they always say we would love to have solar panels on the top of this roof because it's a huge roof yeah. and it's flat, so it has a huge potential to, to generate a lot of uh, energy. Excellent. Phil, it's been a pleasure to have pleasure. you on the pleasure show. Is fine. Thank you so much, Paul. My guest has been Phil Rose Donahoe. He's the manager of cultural services for the town of Georgina. We gotta go and pay some rent, so we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Politically speaking, here on Rogers TV, I'm your host, Paul Nichols, and we are on the road today. We are actually at the grand opening of the Link, the Link in Sutton, the new community hub that the town of Georgina has put together with uh, funding from a number of different sources. And this is going to be, I think, a, a fantastic addition to our community. And one of the tenants in the new link is here with me today. And this is the training center and the executive director, John DeFaveri. John, thank good you, to Paul. see you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. So let me just correct. OK. Uh, I'm no longer the executive director. Okay, what are you then? Well, I'm retired, but I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm still, uh, still on the board at the okay. training center. And I've actually had the distinct privilege of chairing the committee here for the Link Steering Committee. Okay. Uh, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing that we're doing for the community. And the Training Center has been excited right from the get-go. We, we received funding a few years ago to do a feasibility study to find out if, we would, if there was an interest in the community around some culinary training. Uh, we were very pleasantly surprised with the very positive response from the community, but our problem ran into we didn't have a facility to do that training. Our own current building that is on Baseline Road would have required significant retrofitting. Uh, it was not designed to have a commercial or a, a teaching kitchen in that space. It would have required uh, a lot of work. It was coincidence, really, that the town then asked us uh, to be involved in some of the background work of, of the link. And one of the things we discovered very early on was that there was real interest within the feasibility study that the town had done for this place, as well as for ours that meshed. The need for the desire to have a community kitchen within the community and all that it would be able to bring to us. So we were delighted because in fact, we were able to take what we learned from our own feasibility study and realize that we didn't have to go through seeking more funding to try to put in our own facility, which would have been restricted and limited in use as far as something that the training center would have used. The opportunity that presented itself here really is that concept of a facility for the community. The training center will have programs that are running out of that space, training programs, but the beauty of it is that we don't have the need to have use of it 100% of the time, which then opens up all kinds of possibilities for local chefs to do some showcasing, uh, for other town functions to occur, other groups that want to use it, uh, some of the church groups, for example, instead of using the facilities that they would have, now have the opportunity to do this. Uh, I think it's an absolutely fantastic concept. Uh, I've always been so excited to be part of it. And I really believe that what speaks volumes to the vision of this place is that it's been two separate town councils that have actually said, we believe in what we're wanting to do. We have partners that are intimately involved in believing with us. And I think it's a real testament to that political desire, that political will 
Uh, again, it's quite a different council this time than the previous one, but the commitment's been just unbelievable. And I'm, I'm excited that we're, so many people have come tonight. Uh, it's just a fantastic, fantastic initiative. When do you think the first programs are gonna actually start in the, in the center? Well, we, we know that through some of our other funding that uh, the training center receives, we have a program that's called our SET program. It's Skills and Education and Training for Tomorrow. Uh, one of the programs that we are going to incorporate is around hospitality training. Uh, we also have someone that we're in contact with, a couple of people actually that are in the field of culinary, uh, chefs for example, or people that have worked in that. Uh, and so right now we're, we're awaiting funding opportunities, uh, waiting to hear whether or not we're going to be able to, to do that. Uh, we're the kind of place though, the training center doesn't take no for an answer. So I just, know that. Yeah, so just because one place says maybe this isn't the right time to fund that program, we've got lots of other avenues that we're going to explore. Uh, for us, one of the things that's very exciting as well is we're starting to branch into some social enterprising. So the opportunity to perhaps create a social enterprise cafe involving our youth, giving them an opportunity to actually do some real work, uh, and providing for the needs of the other tenants that will be in the building, probably the next step. Yeah, I think it'll be fantastic. You're going to create a whole new ecosystem of, uh, of people in, in various trades handled out of this building. And are you staying in the old building as well? Yeah. yeah. So we'll have, uh, again, some of the programs that we need to run will require the space where we are now on baseline. Uh, for example, our welding program, we've invested a lot of money in infrastructure for that program, some of our other training programs as well. Uh, this is completely different. This for us is just opening up that world of culinary, hospitality, and who knows in the future what else we might be able to accomplish also being in here. Okay. This is an excellent place to be. I haven't had the Grand Chef's tour. Some, maybe you'll give me one at some point tonight. Absolutely. It's a wonderful <laughs> spot. My guest has been John DeFaberry, and you are the chairman. Chair of the Link Steering Committee. There you go. Thanks for being here, John. Thanks, it's fantastic to have you here. Thank Congratulations you so on this building, Thank and I look forward to great things. Thanks. Thanks. I think really have a good grasp on what hospice Georgina really does. Perhaps you could give me a, or us, a, a story about what it does. Um, sure. Um, hospice Georgina provides non-medical support for palliative people, people with life-threatening and life-limiting illness, and we also provide grief and bereavement support. And I think it's worth pointing out that we're uh, it's called a visiting hospice. Uh, we don't have residential beds. Um, and we primarily work in the community. We provide visiting volunteers to people in their homes, and we also uh, have a lot of groups that meet at, uh, at our office, which will soon be here, or someday be here. Not quite yet, but, but soon. So, yeah. Okay, so what was the attraction to your organization to come to the link? Well, um, Hospice Regina has actually been involved with the town for years on this project. Um, we were one of the first uh, agencies that went to the town when they bought this property to say, hey, we, we want to be involved in this. If you want to do a community hub, we want to be central to that. And we have been all along. But we recognize that the opportunity to work with other agencies 
uh, and with a town in a great central location like this would be great for us in spreading the word about what we do and providing our free services to the community. It gives us a much higher profile. If somebody wanted to um, help Hospice Georgina, how could they go about doing that? Well, there's lots of ways. Um, our immediate need reference to the link is there's this beautiful building here. When you walk through our door, it is unfinished because we need um, funds to finish our space. Okay. So donations are always welcome. Um, and for people who are maybe looking for a different way to help, we have a large uh, group of volunteers. We have about 76 volunteers right now that do everything from friendly visiting in the home, facilitating groups, fundraising, uh, answering the phone, all sorts of different uh, volunteering opportunities at hospice. So you asked for donations. Where would they make donations if they wish to make donations? Well, they can donate to Hospice Georgina. Um, we're currently located um, 152 High Street in Sutton. Um, you can give us a call at 905-722-9333 um, if you want additional information. And we serve all of Georgina. We're located in Sutton, but we're for all of Georgina. Okay. So if, if somebody were to, like, what's the typical situation where a client would come to you? And, and who is the client, typically? Um, in terms of palliative clients, they tend to fall into four different categories. Um, people with cancer, um, people with um, large organ, major organ failure like COPD, congestive heart failure, things like that. Um, neurological disorders like um, ALS or MS. Um, uh, and then uh, dementia and Alzheimer's is another big category. So we support the client, but also their caregiver and their family. Because when uh, um, an individual is dealing with a condition like any one of those, it affects more than just that one person. So caregiver respite is a big part of what we do and supporting the family. And uh, when the day comes of bereavement that somebody passes away, we're still there for the family to help them in their grief and help them learn coping skills to, uh, to move forward after the loss. Who would the average client be of, of Hospice Georgina in terms of what age and, and what demographic? And well, um, we, we serve all ages. Um, we serve a lot of seniors, but we also serve a lot of adults. Um, we provide um, uh, grief and bereavement services to the schools in Georgina, um, and, and we can serve youth as well. Um, and it's it's any any resident of Georgina. Um, we don't do we don't really work outside of Georgina much, but it's all all different um, ethnic groups, um, different religions, uh, different age groups. Uh, if you're Georgina, we welcome you. Right on. Okay. So how, where do you get your funds now, like other than just fundraising? Yeah. For, for operations, um, we get about half of our funding from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care okay. through the Central Lynn, and that pays for our palliative program in, in part. Um, we are also very proudly a United Way Toronto and York Region partner agency, um, and they fund our grief and bereavement program uh, completely. Um, and then that leaves about a quarter of our budget that is fundraised. And I'm proud to say that that, that fundraising that we do in Georgina, it's, it's the people who live here who make donations, who participate in our fundraisers that fill that gap and make, uh, make it possible. Because without that, you know, we still wouldn't be able to, to operate. Georgina has always been a very giving community. It it's, is. It, it always steps up whenever there's some uh, important cause. Uh, Georgians are there with their uh, checkbooks and their, yep. their donations. And their effort, yeah. Between either putting your hand in your pocket or putting your hand out to help, we get a lot of that from Georgina. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so, well, when do you move in? Are you like, you're, you're not quite ready yet, but you're. No, no. Um, we tentatively hope to be able, be able to move next summer in 2016. But we have um, capital grant applications in to you know, United Way Toronto York Region, okay. and also to um, Ontario Trillium Fund. Right. We don't know the results yet. We're hopeful that we'll get at least one of them. Um, in which case, we would be able to get the work done and get moved uh, by the summertime. 
if you know, there's a lot of demand and a lot of worthy causes out there. If those didn't come through, we've kind of been kicking around the idea of seeing if we can kind of take a Habitat for Humanity approach and you know some volunteer labor, some donated materials, and you know see if we can do do the building proud and do as well in there as they've done out there. So we'll have to see how it goes. I'm sure it'll be fantastic. Georgina will come to the rescue once again. I suspect so. My guest has been Marie Mort, Executive Director of Hospice Georgina. Thank you, Marie. It's fantastic Thank to have you here and best of wishes for going forward. We're going to go and pay some bills. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Welcome back to Politically Speaking here on Rogers TV. I'm your host, Paul Nichols, and in this last segment of our show, we are live, by the way, at the Link in downtown Sutton on Dalton Road. This is the project that the community has been looking forward to so much, and my last guest on this is going to be the person managing this facility going forward, Michelle Van Dentelart. How, how am I doing? Did I do that all right? Van yes, Dentelart? pretty good. Wow. <laughs> you think I knew her? I, I do know her. So how are you? This is like the first day of the rest of your life come tomorrow morning, right? I know. And I, I have to say, my cheeks hurt because I've been smiling so much. <laughs> it was a really good turnout. Um, I'm very, very excited about just the attitude and the atmosphere. And it's exactly what we wanted. We wanted it to be comfortable. Yeah, you know, and anything possible. And I've been approached by so many people about different ideas, different programs. Um, different rental opportunities, so very happy today. So what, are you, what, are you sure, what is your first day going to look like tomorrow? What are you going to do? I'm going to clean up. I <laughs> have to clean up. <laughs> All you, these people were clean. Have you, you seen? <laughs> <laughs> There's probably, yeah. what, 300 people here tonight, eh? Yeah, that's what I hear. I heard some people were saying 325, yeah. 330. There's yeah. a lot of people here. Yeah. It's kind of dwindled off now, but, yeah. you know, yeah. The food was amazing. Awesome. I got to tell you, Corey Dorn is just. And that just goes to show you our commercial kitchen, the teaching kitchen, is going to be so, uh, so successful. We're going to have so many programs in there. And we're open to hear what anyone has to offer as far as ideas for programs in there. And I'm open to anything. Why not? I know. Are you going to be putting my like cell number on the bottom of the screen? Because I, I don't know that I'm that open. Yeah, we'll do a key up. We'll, we'll let them try and figure out how to spell your name. That'll okay. be fun. But uh, now, in, can individual groups that may not necessarily be uh, aligned with the, organ uh, the the link right now, can they rent rooms, like they rent the space there? Yes. yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I just got approached, for example, by a not-for-profit that uh, wants to be able to service clients that exist up here in Georgina. Now, this um, organization is based in Newmarket, and they don't have space up here, but they also don't have a need for full-time space. So they need one meeting room size, one day a week, and they get to rent it at a not-for-profit rate. So it's very reasonable, and that's exactly the kind of thing that's available here, amongst many other things. So have you, have you kind of fleshed out the whole thing about how the kitchen can be used in, uh, in terms of a commercial kitchen? Well, first, um, GTTI, Georgina Trades Training, they have first dibs on the day-to-day -day because, uh, you know, that's one of our core partners. So they have first dibs on that training kitchen in order to offer the culinary arts programs we want to have. Um, but that won't necessarily always be five days a week. It won't necessarily be every single day of the year. So they'll give us notice ahead of time so we know when we'll have windows that it's open and caterers can use it. Um, we've already been approached. Caterers want to utilize the kitchen to do mass preparation of food. So yeah, there's opportunity there to rent. For sure. 
Well, I think you're going to, like, you, you've already, we're going to have the uh, uh, Citizen of Merit uh, Awards. Award of Merit. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. On the 24th of uh, November, yes. right here. Right here. And that's going to be cool. Yeah. I mean, it, it hasn't been here before. Nothing's been here before, that's before right. this event tonight. So yeah. that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And, uh, and are you going to, like, uh, do it in the, in the big room there, the old gym? Yes, yeah, absolutely. And with mingling out here, it's a great, uh, it's great, it's great the way it flows. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. just a, it works. a nice flowing thing. Yeah. So uh, uh, you, you were, you've always been behind the scenes as a, yes. a clerical type person, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Michelle used to be uh, the recording secretary for the library board, yeah. right, for a long time. Yeah. And uh, so now you're in something new. How does this feel? It must be like... You know, it's. Uh, I, I see your feet on the ground, but they must not actually be. No, there. I know it's. Uh, it's something I've always wanted to do. If someone could have, or if I could have written out the perfect job description, this would be it. That's this. Is it. it hits all the marks for me, um, and I really love that the town is moving in this direction with this kind of facility. It's needed, and I, I'm so lucky that they. They chose me to to actually run this, and 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 I think it suits my personality, and that's it makes me happy getting You've up. Always been outgoing. You've always been outgoing as a personality, yeah. so that's a great. And yeah. you're the right person for this because it's yeah. a lot of it's client facing, all right? Yes, it's client a, facing, yeah. and that's a, a really it, vital. Yeah. So you're you're a great ambassador to to the town of Georgina and to okay. to the link uh, as you. a specific thing. So thank you. I look forward to some really great things. Thank you. My guest has been Michelle Van Dentelart. Yes. Did I say it right? Yes. We gotta stretch it out just a tad. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Thanks and we do wish you the best of luck. Thanks. And we, you'll be here for when Phase Two opens. Oh my gosh! Yeah. And uh, that's gonna, you're gonna. You Another think, big party. You think you've been running so far? <laughs> you're going to be running. I can't hide. Uh, no, can't yeah, hide. no, no. You, you can run, but you cannot hide. <laughs> I think this is a really great thing, and, and uh, congratulations on, you. to you and Phil and everybody associated with it. This has been Politically Speaking. I'm your host, Paul Nichols. You can catch to, up to us on uh, Politically Speaking Georgina on Facebook, and you can email us at psgeorgina at rogerstv.com. Thanks for watching. We'll be back in the studio in a couple of weeks.